we begin our generative model for word segmentation by assuming a probabilistic lexicon. This is simply a frequency-weighted dictionary of vocabulary of words in the language. We then assume that a corpus comes into the world through repeated sampling from that lexicon as a unigram distribution. We know this is a terrible model of actual language, but it turns out that it's powerful enough to do great things in a uh, word segmentation context. So in this model, it's incredibly unlikely to get a word sequence of the form, it is a cute kitty cat, because you have to not only have reached into your lexicon over and over again and gotten it is a cute kitty cat, you have to have done it in that order. Then we assume that the learner gets an input whose relationship to that word sequence is simply the loss of the boundaries between words. So the word boundaries are implicit in the generative process, but they're unobserved for the learner, so you get a continuous input sequence as you see below. Now, this sets up the learning problem, the inferential problem for the learner. The learner has to infer as the segmentation of the corpus into words. Of course, a segmentation into words would imply likely candidate probabilistic lexica. So the learner, if they're using probability, might use, for example, a maximum likelihood or Bayesian inference. So in the maximum likelihood approach, you're looking for, for, for example, the lexicon that assigns the highest probability to the corpus. And then maybe can, given that lexicon, the word sequence account of the corpus that gives the highest probability to the corpus, given the lexicon and the words. Or we might use Bayesian inference. And in that case, we would put a prior distribution on the lexicon and words and use that reconciled with the likelihood of the corpus given the lexicon and words to form a posterior on lexicon and words given the corpus. Now, of course, given the generative model we've described, if you have the lexicon, you get the distribution over words. So that is over word sequences. So it's natural to factorize that joint distribution over lexicon of words, that joint prior, into the prior on lexicon times the conditional probability of word sequences given the lexicon. Now, if we start by examining the problem of maximum likelihood, it turns out that there's a big issue for how it would uh, deal with this problem. Recall that we have to transform a representation in the upper like one in the upper left with no word boundaries tone with word boundaries like in the middle right. And correspondingly, there would be a lexicon with probabilities associated with it. We can do it as you see in the, uh, the upper line of equations where we first infer a lexicon and then condition on that lexicon to infer words, or we might jointly try to choose a lexicon and word sequence. Now, this actually will turn out not to work at all for this problem. And I'm going to leave it as an open question that we can discuss. But I want to point out that, just to give you a hint, that it's very closely related to the problem that we had with mixture of Gaussian models in the continuous space. In the mixture of Gaussian models, we could have, we had the problem of pathologically small and specific categories that would be inferred because they would give extraordinarily high likelihood to individual inputs in uh, the data. In, in the extreme case, you could put a zero variance point centered right on an individual, uh, a zero variance category centered right on an individual point and give an infinite likelihood to the data set. A similar kind of problem arises here. So instead, we're going to turn to the problem to the, the approach of Bayesian inference. With Bayesian inference, we're interested in putting a posterior over lexicon of words given the corpus. Now, the likelihood part of that is very easy. The probability of corpus given a hypothesized word sequence is simply one if the word sequence matches the corpus. That is, when you erase the boundaries in the word sequence, you get the corpus out because the corpus was an unsignified corpus, and it's zero otherwise. So the likelihood question is extremely simple. We also have no problem with the words given lexicon model. That's the unigram model we talked about. The thing that's harder is the probability distribution over possible lexica. In practice, what we're going to do is integrate out the lexicon. And so we're going to get the probability of the words given the corpus as the marginal probability, marginalizing over all possible lexica, of the corpus given the lexicon of the word probability in the words given times the prior probability of lexicon of words given. So, in order to do this, we're going to use what's called the Chinese restaurant process. And this is a metaphor that you'll, um, it's, a, it's a name that comes from a metaphor in, um, uh, came from uh, mathematical probability in the 70s and 80s, and um, it made its way into the Bayesian statistics literature in the, uh, really in the 2000s, and um, has had a pretty big influence in what's called Bayesian non-parametric statistical models, which this model is an instance of. So the metaphor is as follows. Imagine an unbounded in size Chinese restaurant. Huge restaurant with an unbounded number of tables, and each table can seat an unbounded number of customers. So this is an example of the set of tables that you see before you. Um, and for our learning problem, we're going to say, okay, we're going to think of those tables as categories, in particular the possible words in the language. And the customers at a table are instances of that category. So the word tokens, instances of that word in a corpus. 
At any particular time, we'll call ends of k the number of instances that have been observed of category k, and we'll call the category of the ith customer z sub i. The probability in the Chinese restaurant process of the next instance that you observe as you continue to accrue data being in a particular category is as follows. For every category with at least one instance, if that category is category k, then that probability is proportional to ends of k, the number of customers already sitting at the table, the number of instances of that category that you've already seen. The probability of encountering a new category is alpha dot. Now you'll notice that this means that this always, no matter how many categories you've seen so far, this model puts some non-zero probability on seeing a new category. When translated into the problem of vocabulary, this is a very natural way of saying there's no upper limit on the vocabulary size of a language. And this is an instance, once again, of a non-parametric problem. Now, we're gonna couple the Chinese restaurant process with what's called a base distribution for word forms. So the Chinese restaurant process gave it a distribution over word frequencies. That is, it implies, if you were just to run it forward, stochastically, over and over again, you would get different histograms of word frequencies from the most frequent to less frequent words. And there's some distribution over those histograms. The second part is gonna be this, this distribution over what the forms of words are. And we're gonna call that, that's called the base measure. In the Goldwater et al. work that this is, um, that we're describing here, it's called um, P0. The simplest such model is one in which the lengths of words are geometrically distributed. The uh, geometric distribution parameter here is P sub hash, which we're gonna say the probability after any particular character in a word ending. And given a particular length of a word, the word forms are uniformly distributed. So all words of the same of a particular length are equally probable. Now, this is the simplest such model. Actually, you can do a lot of interesting things with this model by relaxing that simplicity assumption and allowing there to be a little more complexity in the distribution over word forms. But we're just gonna cover the simple model today because it's already very rich. This yields together a two-stage view of the generative process. So, and I'm gonna give you the, the sort of walking through the incremental generation of a corpus. So the first word comes in and capital T here, will, you can think of as the word type or the table in the restaurant. So T sub one is the, it's an, it is a token. The first word that you encounter is inevitably a token of the first category because it's the first thing you encounter. And maybe the second token that you encounter is different from that. And so it will be um, T two. The third token might be another instance of T2, by chance. And the fourth token might be another it might be an instance of a new word. The fourth, the fifth token would be an instance of another word, yet another word. So we now have five word tokens, four word types. Maybe the next token is another instance of the first word. And then we get a new word. That's the first stage. Notice that we've generated a sequence of word identities. Correspondingly, we now also have a histogram of word frequencies, 22111, but we have not assigned forms to these words yet. So that was the first stage. The second stage, we use the P0 measure. We sample stochastically from that to generate labels for the tables, that is forms for the word types. And then to create our corpus, we just substitute in those labels for these placeholders T sub i, and we now get a corpus. That is the two-stage generative process within the Chinese restaurant process of what we've talked about here. Now that actually turns out to be a, a case of the probabilistic lexicon sample from the probabilistic lexicon view uh, under a unigram distribution view of uh, the generative process. But what it's done is it's rendered the probabilistic lexicon implicit. Under, and it implies a particular distribution over probabilistic lexicon, but you're never gonna actually have an explicit representation of the probabilistic lexicon itself. You're marginalizing over that. These two stages comprise what is sometimes called a Dirichlet process. And uh, in this, sometimes the notation for this is that you have on the bottom, uh, on the top, you have um, that the words are um, uh, words conditioned on the grammar G or the generator G are, are uh, distributed as G. And G itself, the generator, is characterized by the um, alpha naught which tells you how likely you are to sample new stuff, how much new stuff you have. Um, and then simple, a second, the base measure, which characterizes what instances actually look like. This is, as I said before, an example of a non-parametric Bayesian model. What non-parametric means here in this case is that the, it's, not, it's not a bounded in size 
model. So there are, even though there's actually a very simple set of parameters that underlie the models, it's not that the model doesn't have parameters, it's that the model is unbounded in size. And if you think of the probabilistic lexicon and each of the words in there having parameters, uh, having a frequency parameter, you can sort of think of this as implicitly representing an infinite set of parameters. And that's another view of what it means to be non-parametric. Okay, so one other, another way of recapping this model, this is an equivalent description, is that the complete story of how a corpus comes into being is that first there's a probability distribution over the length of the corpus. So there's this other parameter that I haven't explicitly talked about yet, which is P sub C hash, which is the probability of the corpus ending after any particular word. So the corpus length is geometrically distributed here. Next, there's a probability distribution for the type identity of each new word that we talked about before. Um, old word types uh, have probability proportional to how f their frequency so far. New, uh, a new word always has a probability proportional to alpha naught. So as the data set gets bigger and bigger, the probability of encountering a new word next becomes smaller and smaller, but there's always some non-zero probability of doing that. And finally, the distribution of the phonological form of the word type is uh, this P naught, which has a very simple form. Now, how do we do inference in this model? It turns out we can use Gibbs sampling again, as we did with the um, phonetic category learning problem, we can use Gibbs sampling here as well. Recall that Gibbs sampling is a Markov chain Monte Carlo method from sampling from a joint distribution on X, a collection of random variables, we'll call it X1 through N. In our case, what we're gonna say is that the X's are binary indicator variables positioned in between at each petition of possible word boundary position. And the binary indicator value variable signals the presence or absence of a word boundary at that position. So it's going to be a zero or one, where zero means there's no boundary at this position, and one means yes, there's a word boundary here. So I've indicated here with the gray dots the possible word boundaries, and that's going to be the collection of x sub i for this particular corpus. Now, let's imagine, once again, remember with Gibbs sampling, you start off by initializing x to some set of values, and then you, you iteratively consider each position, each x sub i, condition on all the other values that you have hypothesized for all the other x sub i, and then resample from the conditional distribution on that particular x to decide whether or not it, what, what its new value will be as an update. So let's imagine that at a particular moment in time, we have these uh, word boundaries here. So uh, at some positions, we have word boundaries and some we don't. And we hypothesize now, let's suppose our x sub i that we're considering at the iteration in Gibbs sampling is this position between pet and the. So will we have a word boundary there or not? In order to figure this out, the easiest way to do it is to compute the probability ratio of there being a word boundary there given all of the other hypotheses, hypotheses uh, about whether there's a word boundary at every other position. So x sub minus i is, an, this is a summary of my current sample for all other positions. And I will compute the ratio of the probabilities of the presence versus the absence of x sub i at that position. It turns out that that's convenient because a lot of things will wind up canceling out. That's, a, uh, that's part of a, an ass a homework assignment that you have. And, um, and from that, of course, from a probability ratio like that, you can actually just get the probability out as well. So looking back at the lower left, which is the full parts, the three parts of this model, we can see what kinds of things will influence whether or not you want to have a boundary there. And what you can do is you can ask, well, how probable would the corpus be if I had a boundary? How probable would it be if I didn't have a boundary? And that's going to determine the ratio. So what would inserting this boundary versus not having a boundary there do? So first of all, relative to not having a word boundary there, having a word boundary would increase the corpus length. You have one more word. That's going to change the value of this uh, quantity, which tells you, which is sensitive to how many words there are in the corpus. Second, we would have we would not have the word petha in the lexicon because there would be a word boundary there. Instead, we would have the word pet. So that would influence things because the word petha has a lower probability from the generator, from the base distribution p naught, because it is a longer word than the word pet. So insert a word, inserting a word boundary will be actually favorable. Now you'll notice that we would also have the word the, but the word the already occurred earlier, and so. We don't have to generate it from P naught again. Finally, you'll add another token of the, and that will have some probability which comes from this component. You would be reusing old word type. 
So those three things together will guide um, the preference at any, every particular point in Gibbs sampling for what you do. And overall, repeated instances of Gibbs sampling, as I said before, will take us to an increasingly accurate approximation of the posterior distribution over word segmentations uh, under this generative process, under this generative model. So let's see how it does. So first of all, we can take it and compare it to some previous simple models of uh, unsupervised word segmentation. And um, this is the unigram model on the bottom line. Uh, and it turns out, so precision is basically of the thing, of the word boundaries or word tokens or lexical items hypothesized by the model, how many of them are correct. And um, recall is of the ones that are, um, uh, the ones that, uh, of the ones that are present in the ground truth, how many are correctly identified by the model. And it turns out that as you can see, so the, so the green uh, numbers are the ones in each column that are doing the best. So the, first of all, this model is extremely precise in the word boundaries that it proposes. So when it proposes a word boundary, it's almost always correct. It's also better than the other two models in recovering um, lexical items but it seems to under segment. So it's recall of word boundaries is not very good. And as a result, it doesn't have great um, performance on word tokens. So let's actually see what some of the qualitative results look like. If we just look at example word segmentation. So this is an example sample from part of a, um, from part of a word, uh, from par part of a corpus with, uh, with this model run on the entire corpus. And obviously this doesn't look perfect. You can see that it under segments, but actually if you think about it carefully, actually some of the under segmentations seem quite plausible. So in particular, for example, it seems plausible that a child might not have yet recognized that can you is two separate words because it occurs extremely frequently as a unit next to each other in a corpus. Likewise, a doggy, a boy. It's actually empirically observed in the uh, child language acquisition literature that, that sometimes young children will actually think that the, the word a uh, is actually part of a prefix, it's a prefix to the actual noun that follows it. So some of these under segmentations are actually quite reasonable from a cognitive point of view. So even though this model actually performs quantitatively according to sort of the adult English ground truth, in terms of uh, recall, not quite as well as the other models uh, that we compared it with, that, that distance between the, gold tr between the ground truth gold standard and the performance of the model actually might itself have some uh, explanatory power. 